Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Copenhagen, those of you who don't live here. My name is Martin Breum. I'll be your moderator this afternoon and tomorrow morning and so forth. As you may know, in this country, uh, there is one family that tends to be more popular than any other, which is the royal family. And uh, a lot of people would like to spend time with the royal family. Uh, so many conferences ask the royal family to make appearances. Uh, very few are as lucky as we are, uh, since we have actually amongst ourselves, as you have noticed, a member of the royal family. And there's a history to that that I'm sure you will learn more about. Let's say, uh, let's just leave it at uh, one sentence, that the royal family has been with the oil and gas business in this country from the very beginning. And in Denmark, that is no small matter. So it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, His Royal Highness, Prince Joachim, of uh, the uh, Royal Family of Denmark. Please, and thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Copenhagen and to Denmark. For the next four days, the European Association of Geoscientists and engineers will celebrate its 80th annual conference and exhibition here in Copenhagen. From countries all over the world, we welcome engineers, geoscientists, and industry professionals who will share knowledge, experience, as well as new and future techniques and technology in the fields of geoscience, engineering, and energy production. Denmark like the rest of the world, is in rapid transition. Switching from oil and gas as the main source of energy towards renewables. However, until the day when green and renewable energy can meet our needs, oil and gas will remain the energy backbone of modern society. Denmark is an oil producing nation. And although on an international scale, maybe not an oil nation of great importance, indeed the Danes have benefited, uh, excuse me, <coughs> the Danes have benefited from our offshore, offshore resources in the North Sea. In 1962, when Mr. A.P. Muller was granted a sole concession to search for oil in the Danish part of the North Sea, and when the Danish underground consortium was established with Shell and Gulf, not many believed that there was any oil at all. Exploration wells had been drilled previously with no successful result. It's said that the chief geologist of another large oil company at the time had stated in relation to the prospect of finding oil in the North Sea that he would drink every drop of it. This may be an urban legend. If not, I'm sure he kept his doctor busy. But a recognized interpretation of history tells that even Mr. Muller himself doubted if the North Sea contained any oil, and that his main reason for applying for the exclusive license to explore was to keep the rights to search on Danish hands. Now, we know that there's no longer any reason to doubt. In 1966, the first oil field called Kraka was found below the seabed. And shortly after, two of the largest Danish oil and gas fields to date, Dan and Tura, were found. The first oil was produced in 1972, and my own father, Prince Henrik, opened the taps for the first time back in 1972, and he kept on his desk ever since encapsulated in uh, glass the, first, the very first drops of North Sea oil, Danish North Sea oil. Today, 19 Danish fields in the North Sea are in production. For decades, oil and gas from the North Sea has provided Denmark with great value. Over the years, more than 400 billion kroner has contributed to Danish welfare and thousands of people are today employed in the Danish oil and gas sector. Since 1993, we've been 
producing enough oil and gas to be a net exporting country, which is great news and it would be for any nation. With the knowledge we have today, however, we can't easily predict for how long Denmark and the rest of the world will still need and depend on oil and gas as energy sources. The green transition has great priority and we can be proud that Denmark is in fact a pioneer in this development. But until we can travel by car or plane, transport our goods and heat our homes by means of renewables, we must rely on improving methods to recover petrofuels in a cleaner and more efficient way. Pioneering this low carbon transition in academia and in industry is what the next days are all about. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a successful conference. Enjoy the hospitality here in Copenhagen. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Copenhagen, the Venice of the North. So, don't worry, I have only 186 slides. No, no, such a joke. This is the outline of my presentation, but I will be very, very brief, don't worry. So, but technical program. I would like to emphasize that we have had more than 1,200 papers that will be presented here compared to 1,100 papers in Paris last year. We have 500 e-posters that will be presented, compared to 400 in Paris. We have 18 workshops, one SPE and four AG short courses, and one SAG, DISSC, and three field trips. In fact, we will have 16 oral sessions in parallel each day, and eight poster sessions. So this is a good program. And just I would like to add to that that we have dedicated sessions in geology and particularly uh, this is the first time we welcome AAPG, the American uh, Association of Petroleum Geologists. We welcome them for a, a session which is dedicated to super basins which will be hosted by Charles Stenbach, president of AAPG. So this is uh, the statistics. Just I show you only the, the part, the graph uh, on the right side of the slide. So we have here the statistic of Vienna in 2016. We had almost 4,200 uh, people. But that was uh, the main uh, point of our crisis, you see, in oil and gas. So in Paris, it was much better with 5,200. And to date, uh, regarding the projection we have with uh, registration on site, we expect uh, 5,300, maybe more, we will see. And, but it will be a great event. So, if you want to, for members, if you want to meet us, oh sorry, if you want to meet us, there is a meeting tomorrow afternoon. And you will see the board uh, report on the year's activity. But also, just after, it's a new formula, for one uh, half hour, we will meet you and we, we engage you to come and meet the committees and discuss with them of your uh, needs, what you, you want from AGE. Uh, you, you can meet the technical program officer, the membership officer, and uh, you can discuss and we will collect all your needs and we will try to improve our association. So please, members, come to these meetings tomorrow afternoon. So, student program. This is a, there are a lot of sessions. You see, I will, will not sorry, I will not describe them, but there are a lot. We are we are really uh, wanting to, to develop our student program, and and in fact, uh, we do that with the, the student fund, and which is able to support the future. We have a, we start to diversif diversify our topics. For example, geothermal energy there will be. A first uh, workshop in Strasbourg, I will be myself here. 
And uh, also, we have uh, in the pipeline geothermal events in Asia Pacific, and as you know probably in this, in this continent, those uh, geothermy is probably a, a way of progress in terms of energy. And we have also planned MOU uh, and uh, so on with uh, different associations in the world. So geology. Geology was my priority when I came in 2015 in the board. And uh, in fact, when we, we make uh, some polls, you see, we see that many members are interested by geology, many of our members. And in fact, we are geoscientists, but 40% they say that they are interested in geology, petroleum geology, near surface geology. And we are more geologists in our technical program selection committee. And in Copenhagen, we will have 22 oral sessions in geology, seven poster sessions. And we started three years ago from 10% of geology in the program, and now we will reach 25% which is good, but we want to keep our brand, which is mostly uh, geophysics, and it's why we, we don't want to pass this uh, threshold of uh, 25%. So diversification of topics, everybody speaks about machine, machine learning, artificial intelligence, HPC, so we have a first workshop in, uh, in uh, machine learning in United Kingdom this year in November, also some uh, workshop in Asia Pacific area, and uh, also an event in Manama, Bahrain. Diversification of regions. That was also uh, one of our topics to be developed, you see, during uh, our program, for strategic program for the coming years. We have had the first uh, near-surface geoscience uh, meeting in Asia, in Yogyakarta, in Indonesia. The couple of... Uh, Days ago, we have a first AEG workshop on deep water exploration in Mexico. It's a fantastic success, you see. And uh, we have had uh, many people from Latin America and North America. And uh, more than almost 150 delegates, and it was really a big success. And uh, we'll have this year in China a workshop on unconventionals. And you know that China wants to, to promote uh, its unconventional hydrocarbons, mainly shell gas and shell oil. So uh, the webinars, we, we are modern and we want to develop that kind of uh, media. And uh, we have some uh, webinars about uh, viscoacoustic and geophysics, applied oil feed geomechanics with uh, Jörg Arvanger, who is a member of our board to date. And uh, also we have some, uh, some models on outcrops, you see geology is also here. And we want to be back to the rocks. So, three social events. Yesterday, we had the President's Evening in Tivoli, which is a fantastic park, you see. You should see that if you take advantage of Copenhagen to, to visit that park. Students' Evening will be on Tuesday night, and Conference Evening, it's on Wednesday, and in Locomotive, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, Vekerstedet, oh, sorry. So, we have, uh, just now, after... Uh, my speech, we have uh, an opening debate with uh, four uh, uh, people from upstream, you see. Uh, first, uh, Arnaud Briac, who is president of exploration production from Total, my former boss, in fact. Jess Averti, who is senior uh, vice president development and production in Equinor, the new company, which was titled before. Paul McDonald, which we're working for Wood Mackenzie. And the moderator, as you have seen before, is Martin Braum. Tomorrow morning, there is another executive program about digitalization of ENP industry. As you have seen, uh, we are keen about uh, artificial intelligence and all uh, things able to develop our machine learning. So uh, maybe they will discuss that. So we have uh, John Edgen and Gunn, which is from BP, Ashok Bellani from Schlumberger, Daryl Harris from Woodside, Francisco Ortigoza from Repsol, and Michael Borrell is from Total. We have a special session, uh, Women in Geoscience. We have developed this program a couple of years ago, and now it's working very well. And the special session is on Tuesday between 4 and 6 p.m. Executive program, but dedicated mostly to exploration. We have six uh, leaders in exploration. We have Howard Leach from BP. 
Kevin McLachlan for Total, Luca Bertelli from ENI, Mark Garrett from Shell, Tim Dodson from Equinor, Total, and Rune Olaf Peterson from PGS. And Martin Brome, they will be also the moderator. Young professionals, there is a special session, as I told you, uh, students is a major concern for AGE, so there is a special session on Wednesday between 3 and 5 p.m. in the treehouse. And the last executive session will be on Thursday, 14th of June, in the morning. And we have a panel, you see, of uh, people. They will be led by uh, Isabel Bia, VP Exploration uh, Europe from Total, Nick Ashton, Senior Vice President Exploration Equiner, and the panel, you, you can see their names, I won't detail them. It's on Thursday. So, just to finish, but before finishing, before completing my, my speech, I encourage you to come next year for, to London, which will be the next uh, EG annual conference. And uh, we were in London a couple of years ago, and you see some, some cities that come back, you see, from like Amsterdam, London, I hope Paris also. And we were in Paris last year. Thank you very much for your attention. Martin, please, can you come on the stage, please? I certainly can. Thank you very much. Um, and as the President and the Royal Prince already indicated, we're in a transition era, uh, to say the least. I think you all know that, um, uh, and you know it very well. Um, we've heard how uh, Equinor uh, has now taken over Statoil, um, at least the name. Uh, somehow has changed. Uh, the transition is, is, is very deep and um, consequential. Uh, and this is what we're going to spend now the next hour discussing, the role of oil and gas in this transition era. Not an easy subject, especially not with an audience of this brilliance. Uh, but obviously, uh, the uh, panelists have been very carefully selected. So if I could ask you to take uh, the seats up here, gentlemen. Um, there is a growing demand for oil and gas, of course, in the world. And at the same time, climate change is on the top of the agenda of many governments and corporations and ordinary citizens. Um, and um, we're going to find out how two of the majors are addressing this issue, and also um, an expert is here to help us understand the, the global trends. And as I said, we have an hour, and all of you have an app, but please don't use it today. Uh, you will have uh, ample time to ask questions tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after. Uh, so take <coughs> notes instead, and remember your notes, your queries, your inspirations, tomorrow. Here, uh, I'm going to ask these gentlemen to uh, present uh, their thoughts and views, and then I will ask them a few questions, and hopefully they will have questions for each other. Sometimes we are that lucky. Uh, but let me introduce to you, while I sit down, Mr. Arnaud Boyac, already presented here as the President of Exploration and Production uh, uh, of Total. With Total since 82, uh, worked in Abu Dhabi, the UK, Indonesia, Angola, France. Um, then he became Vice President, Middle East and Iran, moved on to Management, Committee Exploration and Production, and Senior Vice President for Continental Europe and Central Asia. I'm not going to go through the whole CV, but let me say that in 2014, Mr. Briak became member of Total's Executive Committee and President, Exploration and Production, responsible for Total's global portfolio. And thank you very much for traveling and being here with us. Jess Averty has been in the business for more than 25 years in Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, North America. It all began, began in uh, Amoco, uh, in exploration in London, uh, then on to Norway, and from 2000 on to the international scene. Jess Averty has held management positions in Sub-Saharan Africa, including five years in Angola, then on to the Gulf of Mexico, and from 2013, head of exploration in North America, and then back to Norway in 2015, and now not Statoils, but Equinor's Senior Vice President, Operations, Development and Production, Norway. And then finally, uh, from the... Um, 
let's say the the uh, the knowledge house, the think tank, uh, Wood Mackenzie, uh, better known amongst you as uh, Wood Mac. Paul McConnell uh, draws on more than 15 years of experience in the energy industry. He was an analyst at American Electric Power, uh, joined Woodmark in 2006 uh, as an analyst on uh, energy market service, then onto the carbon research team and ultimately onto global trend service. Um, Paul now delivers Wood McKenzie's long-term energy outlook as well as alternative scenarios on global risks and uncertainties. These are long CVs, and I tell you, these are just the highlights. Um, so, um, the way I'm going to ask you to do it is to present uh, within a very brief time span, two minutes more or less, uh, Mr. Voyak and Mr. Avati, how your companies have positioned yourself um, in the light of the transition that we're in the midst of. And then finally, we'll have a global outlook from, from Paul. Uh, so, Mr. Briac, would you care to start, please? Thank you, Martin. Um, Your Royal Highness, uh, distinguished guest, it's really a privilege and honor to be here today in front of you to address such an important subject for our industry and I believe for uh, our society, for the, the world in which we, we live. And um, indeed, our um, company, Total, and we're not going to change our name, by the way, um, <laughs> We, we believe is uh, at the forefront, actually, of uh, this uh, challenge of uh, the, the transition uh, we can see in energy. Um, maybe one important uh, message I would like to pass is that we do not believe, and we've, we've said that for quite some time, that uh, we should uh, confront uh, energy, primary energy sources with one another. We, we believe we need all of them, uh, and as uh, we've seen over... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, history, uh, we, we started from wood, uh, wood to coal, uh, coal to oil, uh, oil to, to gas, and uh, nuclear, renewable, it's a continuum. Some uh, source energy sources are less used, some are more used, uh, and, and clearly uh, we, we need them all. And we believe that the contribution of a company like Total is to provide to our customers affordable, reliable, and clean energy. Uh, and this is why Total is a, is a good name, because it embraces everything. Um, just a few words about where we see the priorities for, for us. Um, we, we have um, uh, integrated the uh, two degree C scenario of the IEA in our strategy. And by that, uh, we mean that we, we look at this uh, scenario uh, as a, a reference uh, which will definitely influence the way in which primary energy will be produced and, and used in the future. And so we want to be prepared for this transition, for this evolution of, of the energy mix. Um, it may not happen exactly as planned by the two degree C, but if it doesn't, it means probably that fossil fuel will remain at a higher level, in which case uh, our, our strategy would, would, would fit in, in that context. But we are clearly advocating uh, to, to have this evolution of, of the energy mix. Um, I think when one think tank, which is Carbon Tracker, is saying that Total is the only company who has really fully embedded uh, this two degree C scenario in its strategy. It's not us that are saying that. Priorities, it's clear that I am in charge of VNP within Total, and uh, I believe my priority is to make sure that we lower the carbon footprint of our oil and gas operation. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later, but that's quite important. We're also promoting energy efficiency as a whole. We think energy is too valuable to be wasted, and we believe there are many ways and means to improve energy efficiency. We're also trying to develop, as a company, a credible, which means profitable, um, activity in uh, low carbon or, in fact, new energies which are not using carbon with the objective to have 20% of our activities which are non-oil and gas 20 years from now. In fact, this was in our 20-year vision two years ago, so it's probably 18 years from now. Uh, and, and, and we believe that uh, this will only be credible, credible for as long as this activity can be profitable. And uh, we've invested heavily. We've invested in the last seven years more than $9 billion in non-oil and gas activities. And I will, I will come back to mm -hmm. some detail about, about this. And last but not least, we, we believe in transparency. 
We believe our industry uh, will benefit a lot from being very transparent about the impact to the environment of our uh, production, of our products, uh, and to engage uh, all of the stakeholders in an open dialogue in order to see how we can move forward, because uh, it's only by collaboration, by addressing the issues, by improving, by getting, of course, uh, government also to, to go in, in, in that uh, direction, that we will make real uh, progress. So, in a nutshell, that's what I wanted to say as the way in which Total is, you know, positioning uh, itself as a company in this, uh, this issue of the, the, the transition on the energy scene. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Uh, the way you can, you can sort of slice it up so we understand the, the main points of your strategy. And just one question at this point. You say 20% of your production will be done by renewables, will be renewables in, or your investments in, when was that? In 20 years. So it's 20% uh, in 20 years. With uh, uh, The flip coin, of course, is that it means 80% will still be oil and gas. Exactly. But the rest will be uh, non-carbon uh, you know, energy. And is that fast enough to remain relevant? Well, again, um, it's, it's an ambition. Um, we want to be at the forefront. If um, we see that uh, this uh, energy you know, is growing at a faster pace while being profitable, we clearly uh, will be ahead and expanding. But uh, I can tell you that uh, all of the projections that have been made uh, in my, you know, IEA by the different think tank looking at uh, new renewable, will probably consider that for a company the size of Total, it means that by 20 years we should have, roughly speaking, about 25 to 30 billion dollars employed in renewable, which is a lot. It is. You would agree with me. Thank you very, very much. We'll, we will come back to all of that. Um, of course, Mr. Avati, um, your business, your company has been through this phenomenal uh, change very recently. I mean, you, you went to the very core of a business, the name, the image, the, your communications with the world, and changed your name. So, I've been looking forward to the next three minutes. Um, tell us, tell us uh, what happened. How did you do it? Why did you do this? Well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, yeah, so I've been given the challenge of summarizing in, in three minutes Equinor's journey along the energy transition. And of course, clearly, one of the challenges you have on knowing where you are on a journey is one, where you are, and two, where you are going. And the harsh reality of the future of energy is that it is very uncertain. Its direction, its speed, and its breadth have very wide, uncertain outcomes. Uncertainties call for the use of scenarios. And that is what Equinor's Energy Perspectives report attempts to illustrate the range of outcomes that may be possible. A world in 2050 where oil demand can range from 60 to 120 million barrels of oil per day. A world with significant increase in demand for electricity, but also a world where the generation mix varies very dramatically. A world that can limit global warming to two degrees centigrade or less, but also a world that in many, many different scenarios doesn't. So do we have any clear indications yet of which direction the world is going in? The reality of today is one of mixed signals. Yes, carbon prices are starting to increase in many regions across the world. Yes, EV sales, EV electrical vehicle sales are booming. Yes, 2017 saw yet another record set for installed generation capacity from solar and wind as costs continued to decrease. But we also saw an increase in demand for coal. We saw an increase in demand for oil. And CO2 emissions continued to rise. So what is Equinor doing to respond? The first thing we did was indeed revise our strategy 
which can be summarized as high value, always safe, and low carbon. The second thing we did was actually create a new business area dedicated to the development of renewables and new energy solutions. We've made significant investments in renewable energy, and we've also set an ambitious target for the share of capital expenditure that will go towards your renewables in 2030. And so we are on a journey. We're evolving into a broad energy company. And we've even gone as far as to change our name. But where do we go from here? How do we continue to navigate this transition both profitably and sustainably? Three points. The first is, we don't actually have all the answers. We don't even know really where we're going. So we have to use our strategy and the three pillars that underpin it to guide the choices we make. We need to make choices that ensure that we are profitable and competitive at all times. The oil industry needs to transform, and we're going to contribute to that transformation through simplification and standardization, together with the development of technologies, new technologies, that will allow us to both work and deliver energy smarter, more efficiently, simpler. And finally, we are committed to delivering energy in a low-carbon future. The, low, well, the future of energy will be low carbon, and we have set ourselves an ambition to be leading in carbon-efficient oil and gas production at the same time as we will build up a new energy business. Thank you. I understand now half of the name change. I can half understand. Is that. I, that's the oil thing. The oil is out of your name, Equinor, there's no oil there, and there is no state either. Where did the state go? Why, why is that gone? The state has served us at very well as a owner and will continue to be an owner in the future. And that gives us a very solid and predictable owner, actually. Mm -hmm. But to take the two parts of the name, Equi, that is a word that is associated with equality, equilibrium, and that really describes the way that we approach our business and the societies in which we operate. Nor, that reflects Norway and our heritage, so it's still a reflection back to Norway, and it's a combination of those. Our proud heritage that tells you where we're coming from, together with our approach to society and the business that we are in. Uh -huh. So it's not because you're moving. We are in a transition, and clearly, this is a name that is much more future-oriented than state oil, absolutely. Huh? So we are on a journey. The, tra the strategy change came first. The investment decisions came first. The name change follows from that. Uh, thank you very much. We'll, we will all come back. <laughs> thank you. Um, because now, of course, as, as I've already promised on your behalf, Mr. McConnell, uh, is a global outlook, um, and, and of course we're all looking now, uh, I, I mean these are enormous transitions, I mean the, the, the numbers, the figures, the, the, the depth of the decision and strategies that have to be made now are, are quite impressive and, and also a bit scary. Um, we're in a transition area, I, I don't know whether that is promising or not uh, to you people, um, but we'll learn more about that uh, in the coming days. Um, so I think we're all looking at least for best practices um, to find out how is this done in the best possible way. I, I don't know whether that's what you're going to talk about. Well, I was, I was going to talk about the, the long-term outlook and the, how, how we see it. So it, it's clear that the world is entering a new phase, of commodity markets are entering a new phase of, uh, of development. We think all markets will reach peak fossil fuel demand at some point between now and 2035. Some markets have already got there. But actually, when we talk about the energy transition, it's coal that's going to be hit first and hardest. Actually, we do see, continue to see a, a quite a robust future, positive growth for, for oil and gas demand for quite a long time. So the energy uh, transition is taking hold, but a, a future for hydrocarbons is, is there nonetheless. Now, one of the things that means is that global CO2 emissions will probably continue to rise, we think, under our base case. Um, growth is slowing, but when we think about 
um, agreement, well, the Paris Agreement, um, we don't think targets for that will be met, uh, although progress is being made and, and hopefully we'll get there sooner rather than later. Um, but just to come back to the point about the way we're using energy, it's changing. And one of the key things, I think, to note is that the use of electricity uh, is, is increasing very quickly. Actually, we think that electricity consumption will grow at twice the rate of fossil fuel demand uh, in the period between now and 2035. And as that share of electricity increases, so does the share of electricity which is generated by renewable sources. So the US, China, and, and the European Union will meet or exceed a 20% share of renewables in the power mix, and by that I really mean solar and wind, um, in the power mix before 2035, and actually the European Union will get there a lot quicker. Now here in Denmark, something of a world leader in that regard, in 2017, 44% uh, of electricity here was, was generated by, by wind, so quite a remarkable achievement. Um, you know, we, we look into the future and, uh, and there, are, you know, there are many risks out there, right? It's very hard to predict what, what's going to happen, exactly what the fuel mix of the future will be. But in terms of adaptation, I think um, you know, being flexible is important. Uh, we might look to a future where oil and gas demand under some scenarios might peak and fall into decline, but there's still going to be a lot of demand out there. So as a, as a producer... Um, you know, having access to capital is really important, um, having uh, assets at the low end of the cost curve, and having a portfolio which is flexible to the uh, uh, responsive and resilient to the, some of the surprises of the future, I think is, is quite important too. So uh, uncertainty is certainly the word, right? We, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's clear that um, the interactions between energy commodities are much more intertwined than they were in the past. Um, oil, coal, gas, renewables, all of these uh, trends in each will influence the other. Um, so the energy transi transition is nothing if not uncertain, but it's very exciting for that, um, for that reason, I think. Exciting, that's a good word. <laughs> um, and and, and you, you say that there is a potential situation where the demand for oil actually goes into reverse. Yeah, uh, there's certainly a, a lot of ways of looking at the future, and it's not very hard to come across scenarios now which predict a peak in oil demand, be that 5, 10, or 15 years in the future. But, you know, if we were to roll the clock back 15 or 20 years, we were all talking about peak oil supply. And now peak oil demand, because of the thing, rise of electric vehicles, because of the importance of energy efficiency, breaking that link between, or beginning to break that link between economic growth and consumption, such things are not quite as outlandish as they sounded in the past. Sir Averty. I think just to be clear about this, that if we are to meet the two degree scenario, coal has to disappear, and there has to also be a reduction in demand for oil and gas, but there still will be a significant demand for it. And one of the associated challenges of that is actually ensuring that we invest enough to meet that demand. A demand that should go down if, we need to get to two, if we're going to get to two degrees, but at the same time, it will require significant investments to ensure that there is actually the supply to meet that demand, even in a reduced scenario. Hmm. Coal has to go away, and oil and gas demand does need to go down to meet the two degree scenario. Yes, please. And uh, just to add one point about uh, energy transition and uh, the way in which uh, primary energy can switch uh, from coal uh, to gas, this is likely to be actually the main switch we're going to see in the next uh, 20 years if um, we I mean, <coughs> believe there is any chance to, 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 to meet or at least to go towards a two degree C uh, objective. Um, and and um, of course, uh, countries for the Paris agreements have made certain commitments to, um, in fact, foster this, uh, this transition by regulations, by taxes, whatever. But we believe as an industry that our contribution is uh, on cost. Because what we see is that when gas prices are low, that is to say when we are able as an industry to produce gas at low cost, then the market share of gas increases. Whereas when coal is cheaper, Maybe some countries can afford to, to buy you know, the, the, the expensive energy, but in, in a number of countries, they just cannot afford. 
We mustn't forget that today, 7 billion inhabitants on the planet, 1.5 billion inhabitants do not have access to energy. And so this, this is a challenge of our industry. How can we provide you know, affordable, reliable, and clean energy? And, and that goes, I mean, we rely a lot on, on cost, our capabilities to lower cost. And of course, you have the, the growing middle classes in India and, and China and so forth, the famous middle classes, uh, who, of course, will demand more energy. They certainly have access to it already, but they want more of it. Uh, so obviously, demand for energy, as we heard, is not going to go into de de decline. But, but what I caught here was that th there are now two representatives on the floor who say that demand has to fall, uh, and it will, per perhaps. Uh, do you agree, Mr. Briac? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, Jess was quite uh, eloquent in uh, the way he was describing the uncertainty on, 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 on the future. Uh, it's difficult to see how energy demand could come down. I mean, even with a lot of efforts, and we are great promoter of this on energy efficiency, using much better the energy the way we are doing today compared to today. And there are many ways, and clearly the use of electricity, the way we can adjust the consumption of electricity uh, in, in a much more uh, subtle way to, to compare, compare to production. But the reality is that with a growing population, you know, 9 billion inhabitants in 20 years, as we said, a significant part who do not have access to energy, how can we imagine that energy demand is going to come down? But, but not, we're not, I mean, the question was not whether energy demand will go down, because I think we all agree that it won't. Uh, and, and the prince so eloquently told us that oil and gas will remain part of the energy mix. I think we all realize that. The question is really whether the demand for oil, as we see it, I mean, the total demand for oil might actually, within a reasonable time span, decrease. It will go into reverse. Do you believe that? I'm not sure. I mean, uh, as, uh, as uh, just mentioned, uh, we have a scenario, not us, but uh, coming from uh, uh, analysts, think tank, that are pro making forecasts uh, that ranges between uh, 70 million barrels of oil per day and uh, up to 120, which is 20% more than what it is today. Uh, and that will depend on a lot of things that uh, we, we, we don't uh, really uh, master. I mean, it will really depend on, we believe, uh, again, cost competitiveness. We see actually in terms of the challenge uh, of the climate change, in the next 20 years, the real issue being coal against gas, or rather gas against coal. Against coal. Let, let's move into the industry itself. I mean, the way that the companies have addressed and are addressing uh, the transition. Um, and we've heard two very eloquent examples, very deep changes taking place, strategies being made, very large figures. Is this the relevant way of doing it? The, the two examples that we've heard from Woodside's, uh, uh, Woodmack's uh, viewpoint, is this best practice? Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to, to Equinor and Total in a minute because I think it's, it's what is quite a, a difficult question to answer is what is best practice, right? We've already discussed what the uncertainty of the outlook is, and I think what you're seeing, at least at this stage of the energy, energy transition, is companies responding to that uncertainty with a number of different strategies, right? So you've had a you know, company like uh, Orsted, previously Dong, moving you know, completely towards the, the, the renewable space. Companies like Total, Statoil moving to Equinor, you know, you've got growing but still relatively small investments in the renewable space, but there is a commitment to go further, you know, to, to, to do more. But I'm sure you, you, you wouldn't disagree with me, both of your companies are still fundamentally oil and gas companies. Now, there is another way of adapting to this transition, and that's, you know, as I mentioned, well, we've, we've talked a little bit about um, oil demand will still be there, even under some of the most pessimistic scenarios. 70 million barrels a day is still 70% of, roughly 70% of, of, of the demand that we have today. Now, one response to that would be, okay, well, I am going to be the lowest cost player. I'm going to be the last man standing when, you know, I'll be delivering the, the, the last barrels of oil. And in fact, if you look at what Exxon has said in response to some of the pressures it has come under to, um, to talk about what it's going to do about climate change, that is exactly its response. 
we have got enough low-cost reserve that we can produce under any climate scenario. Um, so I think there are a number of, uh, you know, a number of different strategies out there, but flexibility is one. I think another thing to, which is becoming more and more important is um, being responsive to the needs of your shareholders, because I think in 2017, it's a bit of a banner year for uh, shareholder activism in terms of um, at least making companies talk about some of these risks. Yeah. You got away with words. That's very nice. Thank you very much. You throw them at me. Um, now, we've just heard that the industry as such are addressing the change uh, into renewables with relatively small investments, I think you said. Relatively small. I thought they were very large when we heard about them. Uh, but from the two gentlemen here, and, 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 and you say there is a chance that if you, if you, in, if you look at being, uh, let's say, the uh, provider of cheap energy, you might be the last man standing. Um, wasn't that exactly your strategy that, as you presented it right before? Are you the last man standing in 20 years from now? Uh, we hope to be one of the last, yes, one of the... Because, we, again, we believe that uh, to be able to produce uh, low-cost energy, and this goes for oil as well as for gas, as well as for renewable, is going to be the key to answering the growing energy demand. Yeah. And this is why we believe that uh, we should not oppose uh, energy, primary energy sources one with another, uh, and that we have to recognize that uh, clearly uh, even coal may continue to be used. We don't want to be involved in coal production. We moved out completely from coal. But uh, we, we believe that uh, we have to recognize that because of this, we need to find solutions like uh, uh, carbon capture, uh, utilization, sequestration, and we have actually a good project with Equinor in Norway to, to make an industrial development uh, of a large scale, and we spend in total 10% of our R&D budget on that subject of carbon capture, because we believe, again, to make oil and gas consumption acceptable in the future, we will need to reach, some, so at some point in time in the future, carbon neutrality. Because on the one hand, we will need oil and gas, we'll continue to need oil and gas, and at the same time, we will not accept to uh, emit more carbon uh, in the atmosphere. So this is the only way forward. Um, and clearly, this with you know, more efficient uh, production, more efficient use of energy, all of this combined will uh, help us to address this issue. And you can imagine that not all companies will be equal uh, in, in this context, and we want to be, uh, yes, of course, uh, prevailing over time. I'm not sure we want to be the last one, but we want to be prevailing over time. I, a I just want to come back to something you said there, because you asked with, to tell, will they be the last man standing? But I, I, think, I don't think that's a phrase that we like particularly much, because our, our ambition is not to be the last man standing, but to be thriving in the future. We, we've spoken about the climate challenge, We've spoken about the challenge to deliver enough energy to a growing society, which in itself, those changes are very uncertain. And of course, for that means for us, as energy, oil and gas companies, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And we need to make decisions that allow us to remain profitable at all times. So it's not just transition at any costs. We have a responsibility to society. We have responsibility to our investors. Related to the speed of change, I think it's very important to remember that whilst market and technology have a huge part to play, it's also about policy. And in fact, we don't think you'll get to two degree scenario without coordinated policy response globally now. And one of the reasons for that is actually to make these renewable opportunities, concessions available to the industry. I think particularly in Northwest Europe, what you see right now is a lack of concessions rather than a lack of capital and willingness to invest in renewable energy. So what are you suggesting? What I am suggesting is that, well, what we, what we say is that to get to the two-degree scenario, technology, market, very important, but also coordinated response, policy response will be necessary. You, you said before that you, as a company, will make um, concerted investments in new technologies. And I was wondering how large a percentage of that is going into renewable technologies. Right. 
So by 2030, we'd be looking to spend about 20%, 15 to 20% of our capital on renewable and new energy pro projects. Yes, that will include generation capacity, solar, wind, and potentially others. But it's also about reducing the carbon emissions from our own production. It's about sequestration, that is, uh -huh. sticking the carbon in the ground. And it's potentially, and this is maybe part of the clue towards CCS, is actually turning it actually rather into a value chain using the carbon rather than it, do it being just a cost. Because that's one of the problems with carbon capture and storage at the moment, uh -huh. is that it's purely a cost. There's, there's no income stream for it. So are there things we can invest in, technologies we can develop, in order to actually turn that into an asset? Right. Um, so, Mr. Pliak, in, in this respect, Equinor's uh, strategy, uh, investing heavily in new technologies, if I remember correctly, that resonated with something you said, uh, also in, in the field of renewables. Can you be more concrete uh, when we look at this part of your, uh, your strategy towards transition? I mean, we're looking at people who are actually in the very industry and lots of students and young people looking for a bright future. Uh, within uh, your company, uh, one of the options at least. Uh, can you be more concrete? How exactly are you going to address this transition within your company? Uh, I understand what you said, and, and I thank you for that. Uh, the figures and the, and the goals, uh, but in real terms, what is this going to look like on the ground? Okay, so about um, a year and a half ago, we, we created a, a new branch in the company, so we have the exploration production, refining and chemical, and marketing and services, very, I would say, typical uh, integrated oil and gas company. So we added a fourth branch, which is gas, renewable, and power. And <clears throat> this branch uh, will grow in the, in the coming uh, years, and uh, we want to, to grow this branch as a profitable business, because we believe that it will only be sustainable, it will only be relevant, if it is profitable. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea that uh, we need to grow our business in uh, electricity generation, in power generation, clearly from our renewable base, and we are already investing heavily in uh, renewable power plants, solar and wind. Uh, but we believe also uh, that uh, because of the intermittent nature of uh, renewable energy, solar and wind, we need to develop batteries. This is why we invested in SAFT, uh, you know, quite an old battery company, who has a, a lot of R&D projects to try to develop the battery of the future, which will provide the right complement, or one of the complement, for this question of intermittent production of energy. And we believe gas has also a role to play, because gas, of all the, you know, um, um, fossil fuel or carbon uh, energy is the one that is the easiest to switch on and off. And moreover, it emits twice less CO2 than coal for the same energy generated. And our ambition is to integrate the value chain, because at the end of the day, all of this has got to be profitable, um, on the gas and renewable, as we did with the oil. Uh, historically, our integrated uh, companies have been very good at integrating the value chain from the oil production, throughout refining, petrochemicals, down to uh, the marketing and distribution of uh, petroleum products to our customers. We need to do exactly the same with electricity, with gas and, re and renewable. It's very important, uh, and, and to do it in a way that is uh, indeed uh, profitable. Uh, reliability comes with it, and affordability. Uh -huh. Mr. Averty, same question. A couple of concrete examples. First, I think within the oil and gas industry, because it's really important to remember we are, as you said, still fundamentally oil and gas companies, and we, that will be an important part of our future. So, on, you emit carbon dioxide as you, produce the, as you produce the oil and gas. So one of the things that we have been focusing on is actually reducing the carbon dioxide from our emissions. So we're very proud of the fact that Statoil's portfolio now produces... Well, Equinors. Equinors, thank you. I'll probably get, that's going to cost me a lot of money that, uh, in the bar tonight. Oh, first one. See how many are there this week. Oof. Anyway, we, the, the, oil, the, the oil barrels we produce have an emission of CO2 that's about half the global average. Uh, we've taken 1.2 million tonnes... CO2 out of our Norwegian production already. We're going to 
we're aiming at another 3 million tons by 2020. How do you do that? You actually have to get engineers and smart people to look at the way you produce, to look at the energy efficiency of your systems, the way that you put them together, and get them to come up with solutions. One of them, which is a lot of our platforms, more of them, or sorry, not a lot, but an increasing number of our platforms, they're powered from land. Why is that a good idea? Because electricity in Norway is generated from hydro. So therefore, you actually have your, your, your power to your platform is zero emissions. An example from renewables, offshore wind, fixed structures, i.e. these are the structures that sit on the seabed, work great down to about a, a, a water depth of 50 meters. Beyond that, you can't put them there. Large parts of the world have water depths greater than 50 meters. So what do you do? You make them float. And then you open up a whole new coastline from which you can install renewable energy. What's the problem with floating high wind windmills? They're expensive. Uh -huh. Again, you bring the engineers in, fix this problem. And so this is very concrete examples of how we need skilled people, smart people, uh -huh. to solve the problems that we're going forward with. I got that part. Um, Mr. Poyak was uh, very blunt in saying uh, the, sorry, obvious, uh, that these activities, of course, have to be profitable somehow. Um, so what's your approach to profitability of, of your new activities? It, it's the same. Every, every decision we make has to support us being profitable and competitive at all times. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you make sure that your new activities in the field of renewables are profitable? Which concrete changes will that demand of your organization? It requires the same discipline within cost that was referred to earlier. But the key here, a lot of the time, is what drives the cost? Well, it's the way you put it together. It's the way you run it. So what you're actually asking your employees to do are come up with better ways of putting these pieces of kit together, better ways of running them, and not least, better ways of getting to them to the market. But what, what Mr. Briac made so obvious, so, so very uh, clear, was that Total's strategy is to approach these new, new activities based on the experience from oil and gas which was to include the, 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 the whole of the value chain from one far end to the other far end of it. Yeah. Are you going the same way? I think that's... Uh, Paul pointed out that certain companies are responding differently right now. Exactly. And I think this is actually one of the differences that you see, that with our heritage as a very upstream company, we're tending to focus our activities in the upstream area for the time being. So we don't have a global network of petrol stations selling to the customer. No, you actually sold yours. We did indeed. So we are, we are choosing to focus on those parts of the value chain that we, that we believe are where we bring our strengths. But there's also no doubt that the future of energy value chains will probably require going downstream. So, so uh, if I can just finish there. Yeah, and, but then you have to ask yourself, am I the best to do that? or am I better doing that in alliance with somebody else? So the floating wind I just talked about, there we've actually uh, uh, partnered up with a, with, a, with, with, a, with a company called uh, Moscar, who are a renewable company, uh -huh. therefore bringing our engineering and knowledge towards their sales knowledge, alliances to actually address that, how do you get moving downstream? And so it's so nice to have an expert uh, sitting here who can tell us about the, the global approach here, the whole industry. Now, there are two different approaches here to, when, you, when we come to the investments and, and the heavy change into renewables that we will see in the next coming years. Uh, which one is more likely to dominate the picture in five years from now? Will the companies go for the complete value chain or are we going to see more of this, uh, let's say, mixed approach of Equinor? Um, I think Jez's point just, just made was really interesting about you know, are you the best people to do specific things? And I think one of the thing that one of the things that's quite clear about disruptive changes to markets, not just energy but elsewhere, is that you know we could think of the, the the evolution of the smartphone as an example. Right, came from nowhere. Within ten years, you had a number of very long established business models completely being disrupted, <coughs> and many people in those established businesses did not see that threat coming. They did not see it coming, and it their 
dominance of the of the industry that they were in didn't protect them from you know from 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 being hit pretty hard. Um, so I think um, the question we often get asked is, you know, should an oil, ga oil and gas company be in the renewable space? Why, why, why should they, right? Why don't just leave it to the, the renewables players? And I think mm -hmm. in many ways that is, a, that is a valid question. So bringing in expertise is, is probably very sensible. I think doing things organically um, definitely spreads the risk. Uh, you know, I, I think there's probably... Um, you know, you could make the argument, uh, positive argument for, for lots of dif different strategies. But again, to come back to the uncertainty point, I think at this stage of the transition, being flexible, responsive, and defensive, as well as looking out for new opportunities is probably mm. the right way to go. I, I, just a point of clear, clarification, I think uncertainties, I, I think we've now learned from, from all three of you that these are certainly uh, the most certain things that, that we have in the room. Um, but you, you talk of disruption, yes. another sort of buzzword these days. What exactly do you mean when you say disruption? Wh which factors are you counting the, on the, here? The challenge for oil and gas companies with this energy transition is that there is probably very little an oil and gas producer can do to moderate oil demand. Right? If electric vehicles become as cheap as normal cars, people will start buying them. You know, that's just going to happen and there's nothing that any oil producer can, can do about that. So then the question is, how do you respond to a market where actually your primary customer base is, is starting to evaporate? You know, and I think that is a very difficult existential question for, for a traditional EMP player to... So, so when you say disruption, we're basically back to the question of demand. Yes, I think uh, definitely this is a demand story, fundamentally, this transition. And it's really, for me, I know policy, and I agree policy is extremely important, and I also agree that getting to those kinds of two-degree scenarios probably does require a concerted policy response. But really what I see now is uh, the march of new technology imposing itself on the landscape of energy demand in such a way that um, doesn't have that much regard for for what was there beforehand, you know? And renewables are, are getting cheaper. We've seen solar costs, uh, record low price of solar broken seven times in the last two years. Mm -hmm. You know, offshore wind is coming down extremely fast uh, in price. And electric vehicles, although they're still a pretty small fraction of the vehicle population, um, are promising great things. And they cost virtually nothing to run compared to uh, internal combustion engines. So, you know, I think that um, what your customers do, or you need to be you know, very well aware of what customer preference is, consumer preference, because they will be deciding what the landscape of the future looks like. Mr. Pritt. Now, if you allow me, I would like to, to do two things. First, put things into perspective with regard to electrical vehicle. Uh, because um, some analyses have been made, we've made our own analysis about uh, what will be exactly the impact of a massive replacement of uh, thermal engines or hybrid engines by purely EVs in, in particular in, in big cities. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm referring to, to uh, external studies, but they, they, they said that the impact by 2040 is going to be between six and eight million barrels of oil per day, which is significant, but is not meaning all of the oil is out because sometimes it's easy to, to extrapolate a, a, a bit quickly. Uh, and of course, one of the questions regarding EVs is uh, electricity is not primary energy, so where is this energy going to be coming from? If it is actually, for example, in China coming out of coal fire plant, it will not have a lot of positive impact. It may have a positive impact on the quality of air in the big cities, but it will not have a, a positive impact on gl global warming issues. So that has got to be put into perspective. But we do believe that, of course, the uh, emergence of EVs is going to have a massive impact onto our markets. And I wanted to, to also add a point on um, the value chain and the disruption. And one of the reasons why Total is willing to be integrating you know, as much as we can uh, down this value chain is because we precisely don't know exactly where will be the disruptions? Where will be the value? Uh, we might have thought that the value, for example, in a solar power plant would be in the manufacturing of solar cells, mm -hmm. like we were doing for you know, oil and gas, being in the producing. It's so obvious today that uh, you can make a lot of money out of producing solar cells because of 
the Chinese, you know, dominance on this market, which is aided uh, by a lot of, uh, you know, sponsoring of, of this activity. I mean, so, um, but what we do see is that if, if we look, for example, as the way electricity will be uh, consumed in the future, and we see indeed electricity being growing fast in the 21st century as the, electric, the you know, the energy use, uh, then we know that there are huge possibilities in managing your own personal electric consumption yes. at your home by uh, taking the opportunity of hours when other you know, electricity is available uh, during the night, to using potentially in the future your EV in your garage as both storage but also potentially a producer of electricity. All of this is going to come out of, you know, innovation along the value chain, I mean, looking at uh, maybe younger generation and why would they be attracted to work in an energy company? It's because us in total, we want to be at the forefront of all of this innovation. And we see potentially that better use of energy is going to be key to the future. And we have a lot to propose in that respect. We just uh, acquired uh, earlier this year a, a relatively small company, a startup, Greenflex, that is doing exactly that, which is actually uh, helping to manage properly uh, the available energy on the grid, and particularly green energy. Uh, in in uh, Western Europe, there is a lot of, of, of work to do and, and value potentially to gain in this particular field of expertise. Mm -hmm. Mr. Afti, yeah, I, I wanted to introduce a new <coughs> word into the, into, the, into the debate, if I can, because you, you spoke about disruption. Um, a word I would like to, to emphasize is, is, is revolution. Um, the reason I say that is that even if we assume that it's reduction in oil demand, an increase in electricity, increase in renewable, I think it's also very important to remember that the scope, the size of the changes needed to get to a two degree scenario will require revolutionary pace of change, even if you use our assumptions. Just to illustrate the point, you need a, to decouple, to break the link between growing prosperity, increasing GDP, and increasing energy. The history of mankind so far has been one of increasing prosperity equals increasing energy usage, mm -hmm. energy efficiency. We need to break that linkage. That's never been done before. At the moment, energy efficiency improves by about 0.9% per year. We need to get it to rates of like almost approaching 3% energy efficiency improvement per year to actually break that link. At the same time as you're putting massive amounts of electric, uh, renewable electricity into the system and a growing population. India, will, welfare will be seven times better, mm. for emissions will be 20% lower. So I think the word revolution, just to get with where we're going is also a very important word here. What will be required? And, and apart from Norway, are there any place in the world where they're doing this well? I don't want you to t say Norway. That's why I took it out of the equation. Well, I wasn't going. I, I certainly wasn't. But, you, but it's a very good important because the, en the very good point you're making here because the energy transition will not be decided in Norway. The energy transition will not be decided in Europe. The energy transition is going to be decided in China, India. In Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. where two thirds of the nine billion people will live in 2050. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to, it doesn't, Norway is totally irrelevant. It is size Europe wise. is not particularly relevant actually when it comes to the energy transition either. Yeah. Let, let's, let's have it from India and China then. Um, we're talking of transitions, of course, of a, of a basically Norwegian and, and Total, which is of course a global but basically mm -hmm. French company. Um, what about the Chinese and the Indians, and how are they going to approach this? Well, I mean, I, I agree that the, the, the transition, the material impacts on energy demand have to happen in, in Asia. I mean, that's just, it's, it's just arithmetic, right? It's just where many, many, many billions of people live. And not only that, there are people coming up the, uh, you know, the income chain, and they're coming up it pretty fast. Um, I think that, well, what, one of the things that we perceive at the moment is that Chinese companies in particular do have not only a vested interest in pursuing the energy transition, but they also are going after it pretty quickly, right? I mean, in Europe, you do tend to see electric vehicles on the road 
quite often, if you go to Beijing, they're all over the place. And they're not the kind of electric vehicle that you would probably be seeing in a showroom in Europe or the US. They're cheap. They're, you know, utilitarian vehicles aimed at, you know, ultimately a, a much lower income population. But the Chinese in particular are making massive investments in battery technology. They're making, they already have made massive investments in, in solar, which is mm -hmm. the single most uh, important fact in driving down solar costs over the last five or 10 years. Um, and as a huge energy importer, there's an obvious advantage for, for, for the country longer term to reduce its dependence on you know, uh, energy that it brings in from outside. So I think that the, the transition will be decided in Asia, but it will probably be decided by companies looking after the interests of, you know, of their customer base first and foremost, and potentially even creating something of a strategic advantage over them. Savity. Just, just to add an interesting point there, because one of the aspects about China is even where it's private uh, initiative, it's private initiative very closely related to the state. So it's actually the state that's pulling the levers here. Mm -hmm. And just to link that back to the point about it's not only market and, tele and technology, but it's policy change as well. And that's, uh, I think that the China is, even where it's private in initiatives, very closely linked to the state. Now, obviously, um, I, I want to take you, us back for the last five minutes um, into this room um, and the, the people who are here. We talked a little about uh, human resources and how this is going to affect uh, the, the hiring and firings of, of the majors. Um, so um, tell them something that they would like to hear. <laughs> Mr. Al. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think it's a very good and relevant uh, question because part of our challenge is clearly to continue to attract talents. Um, we, we believe that our, our industry, uh, and so we, we used to say oil and gas industry, total we say energy company, but the reality is that we, we recognize and we are perfectly clear about the importance of oil and gas moving forward, at least for the next uh, 20 years. Um, but this ability to attract talent is very important. I, I would like to, to pass one message about um, the way we are, we are, as an industry, and more particularly Total, uh, running our business. I think we are really, in all of our new projects, um, all over the world, uh, looking for excellence, but this does involve all of the, the you know, uh, energy efficiency uh, impact. Every new project within Total Portfolio is tested for its energy efficiency, and we actually set up a price for, to CO2. So all of the CO2 that is produced by one project at the time of sanction uh, is valued at about 30 to 40 dollars per ton. So something that we consider is, a, you know, a, quite a, a good level to get a transition and to potentially make a carbon capture and sequestration project profitable. Uh, and so it's very important that, that we do that, and we believe it can be done also on mature assets. And, and it's clear that here in Denmark, where we have, the, I would say, the privilege uh, to uh, have taken over from a Merskoil historic uh, uh, operation here in the country, and in, in your introduction, you, you, you spoke about the historic context of, of this operation, and we are very proud indeed, uh, to, to, to take uh, now the, the lead on this operation with, uh, as uh, you may know, we, we set up here in Copenhagen uh, uh, one of our three technical hub, in fact, for the world, with uh, uh, the two others being in France. So our, our third technical hub is here in, in Denmark because we want to retain all of the competencies that have been developed here in Denmark for 50 years, uh, moving forward in, in optimizing uh, the production on mature fields on a province like the North Sea, where we believe, by the way, there is still some potential. We are drilling exploration wells uh, with uh, our partner Equinor in, in Norway, uh, with other partners in the UK, and we believe there is still potential. So my message to the, the younger generation <coughs> is don't believe that our industry is an industry of the past. We're an industry that is actually looking forward. We're an industry of the future where we have a lot of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we believe, part in total, that uh, uh, engaging all of the, our stakeholders, uh, being very transparent about the need for oil and gas in the future, but also the way in which we consider that we will manage mm -hmm. this need and respond to our client needs in a responsible manner is absolutely essential. Thank you very much. I don't know if that was a promise or uh, 
uh, or, or, or request for job uh, seekers, or, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it to the audience to interpret that. Absolutely. Mr. Avati, um, the, the future of geoscientists, how does that look? The future of geoscientists is bright. Mm. <laughs> and in engineers, and engineers. Um, we've spoken about the fundamental challenges facing society. We've spoken about revolutionary changes in the industry at the same time as we need to continue to produce oil and gas. What's that going to require? Two things. Science, technology, engineering and maths. Leveraging digitalization combined with smart, curious, engaged people to solve these problems. If that sounds interesting, solving the world's problems, using your engineering, your maths and engineering skills, leveraging digitalization, then this is an industry for you. Oh. Not thank you. you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I just thought there was hope. <laughs> Please, can you round this session off by, I mean, you don't have to make promises. You don't have a company like the two others with full of engineers and, and geoscientists and so forth. Uh, so, can you make sort of a realistic outlook <laughs> uh, <laughs> for, <clears throat> for people of this sort? We, we, we've spoken a lot about uncertainty. The thing about uncertainty is one man's risk is another man's opportunity, right? And I think there is a huge opportunity, or there are always opportunities for smart people with good engineering science kinds of backgrounds in the energy business. There's no way that uh, there's not going to be an oil and gas industry for the, the next four, five, six decades. It might look a bit different, but it will certainly be in existence. And you know, on top of that, you've got all the developments in renewables and everything that goes within the, the meshing together of these new energy systems. So I'm confident that there's, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, opportunity in the future, yeah. It does sound promising. Yes, it does. So. We're in an area of transition, but not closures, necessarily. Yep. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for opening this conference in such a qualified and open, transparent way. Thanks very much for traveling. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And now, there's something wrong with my microphone here. Here we go. Mr. Pitou and Mr. Soldo are here, uh, ready for the next part. Please, it's all yours. And the prince, of course. Your Royal Highness. Thank you so much for attending the uh, conference. Now we begin with the award ceremony. So um, I just want to thank you again, uh, Prince Joaquin, for being here. It's an honor for us. And uh, Jane Jobito, our president, will be delivering the uh, prize of these awards. So the first award uh, that I want to uh, introduce uh, in this occasion is uh, the Lori Dake Challenge, which is basically uh, a challenge, uh, a competition between university teams presenting uh, a cross-disciplinary development plan for a field located actually in the North Sea with real data set. The winner of the challenge is going to be selected by the Student Affairs Committee, and it was selected on Sunday, the 10th of June, 2018. That was yesterday, actually. So, uh, as you can see over here, uh, 18 teams uh, belong to this, uh, or were participating in this, in this challenge, and these are the finalists, uh, uh, people who were 
actually uh, in this uh, competition from all over the world, Malaysia, Canada, France, Norway, Bolivia, you name it. So we are very proud of that. So the trophy is presented in recognition of the best final development plan presented in the Laurier Day Challenge in 2018. In order to qualify for this trophy, the development plan presented should show technical excellence with the most attractive prospects. So as you can see over here, in 2019, EAGE presents this reward to the winner who presented the best lorry deck challenge solution on Sunday 10th, June 2018. And the winner is... <laughs> EAG Awards 2018. An important part of the role of a professional association such as EAG is to recognize and honor the scientific advances and achievements made by its members. Every year, in the occasion of its annual meeting, EAG awards are presented to individuals who have demonstrated an outstanding dedication to science and the EAG community as well. The 2018 awards winner has been nominated by colleagues such as yourself, and we are carefully selected by an international awards committee. This year, exceptionally, three candidates will receive the EAG Honorary Membership Award, and two will receive the prestigious Conrad Slumberger Award. The awards committee is led by Anton from the University of Edinburgh, 
and we are very proud to present the following winners. The Louis Cagnat Award. This award is presented in recognition of the best poster presentation in the past EAG annual conference. In order to qualify for this award, the poster presented should be high specific standard and present a significant contribution to one or more of the disciplines in our association. In EAG 2018, present this award to Pamshat Nazarian and his co-author in their poster, which associated with legacy wells in CCS and CO2 in EOR projects, a simulation study presented in the 79th EAG Annual Conference in Paris. The Guido Bonarelli Award. This award is presented in recognition of the best oral paper presented in the past EAG annual. The paper presented should be high scientific standard and should represent a significant contribution to one or more of the disciplines in our association. In 2018, EAG presents this award to Maxim Kirovov and his presentation, Source Site Up-Down Wave Field Separation UN Dual NFH, delivered in the 79th EAG Annual Conference in Paris, 2017. The floor is yours. Thank you. The Nigel Anstey Award. This award is presented to the author of the best paper published in first break in the past year. In 2018, EAG presented this award to King Senge and his co-author in their paper, Effects of Vigneous Intrusion on the Petroleum Systems, a review. And it will be received by his, his co-author, John Millet. <laughs> the Laurent Edwards Award. This award is presented to the authors of the best paper published in geophysical prospecting in this past year. In 2018, EAG presented this award to Hesham Naini and his co-authors in their paper, Well Tie for Broadband Seismic Data. The floor is yours. The Normal Falcon Award. This award is presented to the author of the best paper published in petroleum designs in the past year. In 2018, EAG presented this award to Eric Alvarez and his co-author in the paper quantifying remaining oil saturation using time-lapse seismic amplitude changes at fluid contacts. That's what we're The Ludger Meintrop Award. This award is presented to the author of the best paper published in new surface geophysics in the past year. In 2018, EAG presented this award to Matthias Bakker and his co-author in the paper, An Analytical Membrane Polarization Model 
to predict the complex conductivity signature of immiscible liquid hydrocarbon contaminant. Congratulations. The Robert Mitchell Award. This award is presented to the author of the best paper published in basin research in the past year. And in 2018, EAG presented this award to Paul Green and his co author in the paper Post Breakup Burial and Exhumation of the Southwestern Margin of Africa. Unfortunately, nobody on site will receive this award, so we just clap your hand, Chester. The Ali Van Velden Award. This award is presented to a member of the association who has made a highly significant contribution to one or more of the disciplines in our association and who is under the age of 30. In 2018, EAGE present this award to Lucas Pimienta for his outstanding experimental works as a young scientist on rock mechanics, including application to CO2 sequestration and geothermal energy. Oh. My name is I am an experimental rock physicist currently working in the laboratory of experimental rock mechanics in EPFM. My research has been to select rock samples representative of the field scale in order to investigate their different physical properties, how they correlate and how they are affected by different factors. I did my studies as an engineer of geophysics in Strasbourg and partly at the University of Bergen. My first steps began in 2010 in the R&D department of Statoil in Bergen, followed by a life-changing experience in the CSIRO Perth, where I first discovered the interest and hardship of experimental work. Then I discovered the depth of experimental work physics in the greatly fostering environment of École Normale Supérieure. Over the years, I have been blessed with meeting and learning from amazing scientists whom I owe greatly. I have been truly honored to receive such a prestigious award from the EHG, and I will try my best to be worthy of it in the future. The Alfred Wegener Award follows. This award is presented to a member of the association who has made an outstanding contribution over a, a period of time to the scientific and technical advancement of one or more of the disciplines in our association, particularly in petroleum science and engineering. In 2018, EAG presents this award to Tiziana Vanorio for her in innovative scientific and technical contribution on the geophysical characterization of the effect of rock fluids interaction on rock properties, integrating laboratory measurements with imaging techniques. Hello, my name is Tiziana Manoia. What an honor to be the 2018 recipient of the Wegener Award. My fascination with rocks started when I was 10. I grew up next to a volcano and experienced the exciting and terrifying need to flee my hometown because of the fear of an eruption. But fears and facts must be faced. So this experience laid the foundation for a career in geophysics. Today, I'm a rock physicist, and I work on understanding how rock fluid interactions affect the properties of rocks and geomaterials. One of the most rewarding aspects of my work is watching students grasp the value of science and turn into detectives pursuing scientific clues. So one of my goals has been to make experimentation more transparent to students. I have created an online virtual lab that reproduces the function of instruments in my rock physics lab, guiding students through data acquisition and experimentation. Another goal has been to work with engineers to leverage knowledge of earth processes to make new sustainable materials. I'd like to thank the AGE and those who supported me for this award. As the first female scientist to receive this distinction, I hope I will inspire more young women to pursue the earth sciences, a field that's been never more important. Thank 
Escuchele. And now the Conrad Slumberger Awards. This award is presented to a member of the association who has made an outstanding contribution over a period of time to the scientific and technical advancement of the geoscience, particularly geophysics. In 2018, we present this award to two winners. The first one is going to be Phil Christie for his outstanding ability to embrace the, own, the understanding of Earth properties through scientific research and innovative design technology. His exceptional experience in geophysics, reservoir science and geology, his advisory and leadership role in the scientific community, and his lasting impact on the understanding of petroleum system. The second winner of the Conrad Slumberger Award is given for, to Johan Robertson for his outstanding achievements, the rate of his high quality scientific research and innovation, his mentoring spirit, and its evident industrial impact. My name is Johan Robertson, and I hold the chair in applied geophysics at the ATR Zurich. I have the great privilege to receive the 2018 Conrad Schlumberger Award from the EAG. It means a lot to me that so many of the outstanding colleagues that have been uh, so critical and inspirational to me nominated me for this award. My career as a geophysicist started at Rice University in 1990, where I did a PhD on the modeling of viscoelastic wave propagation. After a postdoc at the ETH, I moved to industry in 1996, where I spent 15 years working for Schlumberger in Cambridge, Oslo, and London, and was intimately involved in the research and development of marine acquisition systems, such as QCBED and isometrics. My research covers physics away from location and seismic data acquisition and processing. For example, at ETH, we are in the process of developing a fundamentally new approach to studying complex wave propagation in a laboratory for immersive wave experimentation. Another example of research is a recent signal processing advance that we refer to a signal apparition that enables a completely new approach to simultaneous source separation and deghosting.
Honorary Membership Award. This award is presented to a member of the association who has made a highly significant and distinguished technical and or non-technical contribution to the, to the science community. At I don't know what did I touch. Oh, yeah, okay. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. So the first prize goes to Aldo Besnaber. His highly distinguished written and oral scientific contribution is in applied geophysics and for his extensive service to the geophysical community, especially for the SAG and EAG. <laughs> I'm Aldo Vesnaver, a professor at the Khalifa University here in Abu Dhabi. Research is my passion. When doing research, you are in front of you the unknown, uh, the things that uh, nobody uh, saw before, and uh, the job is building a bridge between the rational world where we are living and the unknown world which is in front of you. I'm very honored uh, to get uh, uh, such an important uh, uh, award uh, because uh, uh, EAG has in its gene uh, the concept of integration. I would like to thank uh, my wife Dalia, who assisted me for so many years uh, in my career. And that is another, another level of uh, convergence between uh, the uh, daily and the scientific life. The second honorary membership award goes to Ian Jones. His highly distinguished research in applied seismology, especially in velocity model building, migration, imaging, and inversion, for his dedication to the teaching of geophysics and the training of geophysics, and for his service to EAG. Hello, my name is Ian Jones, and I'm a geophysical advisor with ION based in the UK office. As with many geoscientists, I guess I was first attracted to geophysics, as it perhaps offers a unique blend of physics and maths, and a very practical application of both. I started my career, once I'd left university, working on the research and development for algorithms for geophysics. But after a while, I found that my main interests involved explaining the workings behind the technology that I've been developing, and also in explaining the mechanics behind how these things worked. This naturally led on to writing tutorial materials, so lots of publications with the first break on expositions of different techniques, and also in teaching courses, mainly for the AAG, on the practical applications of these technologies. Given all of those interests, it's perhaps not surprising that during my career I've been a member of the AAG, as it offers a natural home for the application and development of interest in this field. And finally, I'd like to thank the EAG committee for making this award to me, which I'm really honored by. And thank you very much for coming today. Bye -bye. And last but not the least, the third praise goes to Mohamed Al-Farah for his highly distinguished research in applied geophysics, for his leadership in exploration and multidisciplinary field development, and for his loyal and devoted service to the international scientific community, including SAG, SPE, EEEE, AAPG, WPC, and especially EIG. Inspired by oil abundance in eastern Saudi Arabia, where I was born, I pursued higher education in geophysics and obtained a PhD degree in 1993 from Colorado School of Mines. Some of my milestones include initiating and chairing a number of international workshops, including the first passive seismic workshop in Dubai in 2006, the first and the second Bothold geophysics workshops in Istanbul and Malta in 2011 and 
2013 respectively with the, the retirement i now mentor young jewish scientists and offer consultation i have served the eag for 30 years in different capacities including the board and i have been an associate editor with the journal of geophysical prospect thing for 13 years I praise the AG for promoting new sciences and engineering globally, and I humbly extend my gratitude to them for granting me this prestigious lifetime honorary membership award. Thank you. This uh, basically officially closes the ceremony. I would like to thank again Prince Joaquin for being here. All the audience, uh, I hope you enjoy Copenhagen and you enjoy this EAG conference. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, just to, to add something, um, we have we'll have the icebreaker now, which will be in the exhibition hall. So you are all invited. And on behalf of AGE, I would like to thank everybody here, the panelists, the awards committee, and all the awardees, as well as AGE employees for having prepared all this ceremony. And uh, I would like especially the panelists and the awardees to come with us on the stage for the traditional picture. And the others, you are free to go to the exhibition hall for the icebreaker. But panelists, please, Martin, and the, all the awardees, you are kindly invited to, to come with us on the stage. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.